in politics, veterans in politics uh, candidate forum today to go over some of the assembly candidates for the state legislature. I want to thank uh, our sponsors today, Rhythm Kitchen Restaurants, uh, the restaurant here at Rhythm Kitchen, uh, Real Water, and Richard Scotty, a Nevada attorney here in Southern Nevada. I'm the moderator, Cam Walker, from Boulder City Councilman and the Mayor Pro Tem. Glad to be here with some great panelists. Before we get started, we want to have an invocation by George Jehadis and then the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'll turn it over to George. Let us stand, please. Father, please be with us today and always. We know that we are in troubled times and the world is in turmoil. We ask you, Lord, for a better world for our children. We, keep, we wish to keep the fires of freedom burning brightly and the skies over this great land of ours, and that we will always keep you, O Lord, in our hearts. We pray, O God, that you guard our homes, churches, schools, our entire land, and all therein from harm and destruction. Please preserve the integrity of this nation, founded on religious principles, by protecting it from all enemies within and without. Lord, please look after those who have fallen in defense of our country. Also comfort and strengthen the loved ones of those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Please bless and watch over our men and women that protect our freedoms all over the world. And now, great God, give us the power to believe in ourselves and in what we can do and in what we can be and in what we are. May the grace of God be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Join me, the flag is right behind us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. I'd like to uh, acknowledge and thank our panel members for taking time out of this Saturday to, uh, to ask good questions and to quiz our candidates. Um, our panel members are Karen Steelman, one of the Auxiliary Directors for Veterans of Politics, Tony Baca, a mortgage industry professional here in Southern Nevada, um, Steve Delano, a project manager, Tom Blanchard, the President of Veterans for Real, in Real Estate, uh, Daphne Lee, Nevada Director of Panda, uh, Dr. Danielle du Dupere, uh, Brian Bichon, U.S. Army, President of the Fallen Not Forgotten, and Michael Broadway, a realtor here in Southern Nevada, and Cheryl Prater, a business owner. Thank you all for being here. Our first candidates today are for State Assembly District 13. We're pleased to have uh, Paul Anderson, the current Assemblyman, and Christine Lynn Kramer, who uh, is seeking that same seat. So we want to start right into questions because we have a limited amount of time. Just uh, for a moment, we want to make sure that you know the the rules and the ground rules of this, each of the candidates get one and a half minutes for an introduction for themselves before we start those questions. And then the panelists will have about 30 seconds to ask the question of, of one of you, and then the candidates have a minute to respond to that question. So with that, we would like to start with uh, the candidates having a minute and a half, minute and a half introduction. So with that, uh, we went alphabetically, so uh, Assemblyman Anderson, if you would start. I appreciate the time. I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, this afternoon as well. Thank you for doing this. Uh, I, I've learned a lot about other candidates just by watching some of the videos, so it's, it's been good to have those up online and uh, learn more about some of the other districts that are going on. Uh, I'm a native of Madden. I've been here uh, my entire life, as, as the definition goes. Uh, I'm a third generation. My grandfather came here in the 1930s to work on Hoover Dam, and uh, he was a blacksmith, and, and he worked there uh, as a union laborer uh, for most of his life through union jobs as an iron worker as well. Uh, my father followed in that same trade and uh, eventually worked for the city of Las Vegas in the public works department. He was a city engineer for about 15 years. Uh, could be responsible for the good roads, not so much for the ones that have potholes, he'll claim the ones that don't. So, uh, it, it's been good to have some experience on that side of the family as well. Uh, my wife's side of the family has deep roots in the valley as well. Her great-grandfather came in 1939 and started a company called MJ Christensen and Jewelers. Uh, and they've been here ever since, so she's a fourth generation. We have four kids together. We've been married for 22 years, and uh, we 
got a son who's 18, getting ready to graduate here in June. Uh, I've got a daughter that's 16, those are the ones that don't like me so much. I have two younger kids that still like their dad that aren't teenagers, so my, my 13 year old's right there on that, on that breaking point. But uh, I have a 10 year old and a 13 year old, both in the, all four in the Clark County School District. Uh, so we have a lot of investment in the Valley. Uh, I'm a small business owner. Uh, we employ almost 30 people now, we've been hiring. Tech industry, and we service uh, businesses throughout the west west coast, all the way from Salt Lake to Seattle, uh, down into Phoenix, and, and into California. So, thank you very much. Now, Ms. Green. Thank you. Uh, it's so hard to lean over. My name is Christine Kramer. I am the mother of four. I also live in the Assembly District 13. Uh, I have a diverse experience from the entertainment industry to being a warehouse manager over 600 employees in the middle of the Nevada desert to uh, working in entertainment. I've worked for uh, entertainer Steve Rossi for a number of years managing his personal business affairs. Uh, I, this race is important to me because I live in this district. Uh, my party made a decision that they were de facto going to endorse my opponent uh, and I didn't feel that that was right because I feel that I have a different set of values that are diverse and that I needed to represent uh, my side of the issues. Four kids, uh, 16, 14, five, and seven. It uh, keeps me busy. I also work as a database manager for a real estate company. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also just want to note that we want that we don't want this to be a place where we air grievances or or get into the to the negative aspects of a, of a political race. So I appreciate the fact that we're all here asking important questions going forward. So. I'd like to start with uh, Ms. Lee, if she might ask the first question. Hello. My first question is, uh, many states are currently putting forth legislation that would block some of the practical effects of mass data collection by the National Security Agency by refusing to provide material support for, or assist, or in any way participate in the collection of a person's electronic data or metadata by any federal agency unless the data is collected pursuant to a warrant that particularly describes the person, place, and things to be searched or seized. Would you be supportive of such legislation if you were elected for next session? And that's directed to? Um, both candidates. All right, Ms. Kramer, if you want to start uh, this question, and then we'll start with you on the next. I absolutely believe that the illegal search and seizure not pertaining to a warrant is against our civil rights, that we we need to have more whistleblower protections that our current uh, administration turns around and they convict people for whistleblowing on the data uh, that's collected. Uh, that I'm particularly concerned about the new Common Core standards that we're collecting over 800 data points on our children that will follow them and we don't have any protections under the law that will prevent a future school district and future legislators from deciding that that, that, that data is particularly valuable and that they may choose to sell it in the future because we always have budget shortfalls. I don't want there to be a <coughs> dollar point uh, on the data that's collected of, about our families and about us as individuals. So I would support any legislation that requires specifics uh, when they're going back and they're looking at our data. Thank you. Great, thank you. Sure. Thank you. So <clears throat> last cycle, we did, we did pass some legislative, uh, well, we passed a couple different laws that were, were in regards to personal privacy. Uh, a lot of them related to the employer-employee relationship in regards to an employer being able to force somebody to give up their Facebook or Twitter account logins in order to uh, get access to those. Uh, we made that illegal. I think it continues on that same path that we need to continue to protect our consumers, uh, whether that be from the federal government, whether that be from their employer or, or uh, people that would use that uh, data incorrectly. So I would absolutely support continuing to protect our consumers. Thank you. Mr. Blanchard, if you might ask our next question. If it goes to one, please do. If not, we'll go to Mr. Anderson. Yeah. I want to thank you both for uh, coming out and participating in this rather gruesome uh, panel questioning at times. Um, let me ask you this. Um, we have question three coming up in uh, November's ballot, which is the margin tax or the, the education initiative, as it's being called right now. Um, one, I want to know if either one of you for it, against it, and two, uh, if you're against it and it doesn't pass would, and you were elected, would you be willing to sponsor a tax like a 
um, sales tax on services or something else of that magnitude. That'd be, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm absolutely against them. question number three. Uh, as you well stated, it's uh, the education initiative on one side, the margins tax on the other. But on the ballot, it would be known as question three. Uh, and, and I'm absolutely a no on that. I think it's detrimental to our state. Uh, we, we've worked with a lot of our clients are CPAs, and they're putting out pro forma statements on the economic impact of their direct clients. Uh, my statement that came through was almost an 18% effective tax rate based on my company's revenues. I can move to California and pay a lower tax rate on the corporate side uh, by running my business in California. I don't think that's good for Nevada. It would pull out over half a billion dollars out of the economy, and I think it would be detrimental to the consumers and those who need jobs and who are, who are seeking uh, those jobs that are just now kind of coming around as the recession uh, let, you know, let, let goes of its strangleholds on us. Um, I'm, I'm not interested in, in proposing any new taxes. I think that there's ways that we can grow out of this recession. I believe that the revenue grows as the economy grows. And that has been shown whether we were in boom or bust. And I think we need to make, make sure we're managing ourselves within those, those uh, guidelines. Thank you. Okay. I'm withholding my endorsement on question three. I did work with individuals who drafted the measure. I was not part of the uh, final formation of it. I am awaiting the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce what their alternative solution would be in weighing those two alternatives <coughs> as to if I'm going to endorse question three or not. So the second part of this question was potentially looking at another <coughs> revenue source. I believe that we need to look at that Southern Nevada generates 85% of the tax revenue for the state of Nevada, and we only get to keep 30% of that for our schools. Our legislature should have done a better job last session instead of kicking the can down the road as we've been studying that tax balance since 2007, I believe, that we should have sought that solution first before what's happened with TEI is that we have made the people who are dedicated to finding fun some funding for our schools. It's a reality our schools need funding. We have made Southern Nevada carry water, uh, put together this TEI bill when we have other tax sources that Southern Nevada is already paying for that we have done nothing to secure for our students. Elko operates at a $5 million uh, uh, over, over in this session, and that's thanks to our tax dollars. That should have stayed in Clark County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buck. Okay. First of all, thank you both for being here, Ms. Kramer and Mr. Anderson. Um, my question is for Mr. Anderson. Explain um, in short, give us a short explanation of Assembly Bill 227 and, um, and what you're going to do to, uh, to press forward on that bill to, um, in, in working with the federal government. And what, what are your results so far? Uh, 227 in regards to the public lands. Yes, can you explain, give us a short explanation and explain what you're doing? Sure. I think um, you know there's more. There's folks in our caucus that are working much much deeper than I am on 227. There's a there's a whole slew of folks uh, that work on both the interim committee on public lands as well as the legislation that's come through. Um, it, it's a deep issue and it's a deep seated issue in many of the rural areas as well as the urban areas. And certainly gaining more control over our, our sovereign state. Um, I can't tell you anything specifically that I've worked on in that particular legislation. It didn't come through any of the committees that I worked on, um, and it didn't make it make it very far through, um, as far as discussion points go, uh, through a lot of the other committees as well. So. Thank you, um, Mr. I'll just add that I'm in support of it in, <laughs> of the bill. Hi, um, thank you both for attending. Appreciate that. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm an avid outdoorsman. Hunter, fisher, camper, horseback riding, stuff like that. I also have a family, a uh, home, and stuff. And my concern is, with all the legislation and everybody touting all the good and the bad about gun owners and gun rights, I carry a gun for protection. I'd like to know what your positions are on Second Amendment and, and decreasing or increasing legal hurdles to obtain a firearm. And your, your thoughts along with that of using it for personal protection especially with the lack of response from Metro, the way they come out, the brutality that they inflict, thinking that they have the rights 
without getting the full story or anything like that, automatically throwing someone to the ground because they've defended themselves <coughs> with a firearm, which is not pointing at them, but just in situations like that. Um, both of you, please, um, if you care to. Thank you, Mrs. Kumar, please. <clears throat> I live in a family that we have firearms. I used to have a concealed weapons permit when I lived in the state of Oregon. I don't believe that I should legislate in any way that would prohibit another family from enjoying the same rights that I have had to protect my family. However, I don't believe that everyone is a responsible person that we should uh, automatically anoint um, to protect us. That there are irresponsible gun owners. There was an irresponsible gun owner in my district that resulted in the death of a nine-year-old girl. He kept his gun with the breakfast cereal and she came to visit the home and she was shot and killed. That our district attorney's office doesn't do anything to prosecute those who hold their firearm irresponsibly and that reflects poorly on the rest of us who are responsible gun owners. I am additionally, I'm concerned with the gun legislation that I have a stepson and I have a son. My stepson has blonde hair, blue eyes, my son has dark skin and uh, it appears to be a minority that when I think about the stand your ground laws, my concern with that is, is that my child who happens to have darker skin may feel more intimidating to a person just by their actions than my stepchild who has blonde hair and blue eyes. And those boys have been raised fundamentally the same. They're both good boys. That I will allow, I, it will not seek legislation to restrict someone else's gun rights, but I am deeply concerned about the racism that is connected to stand your ground laws as they have been enacted. But I can look at my own child and say that he is not a threat, no more threat to anyone else than a person with different color skin. Thank you. Thank you. I, I firmly support the Second Amendment. I think that we have uh, gun laws in this state that are restrictive of that right. Um, partially, in the idea that I do carry, I have a CCW permit as well. I'm permitted in I think something like 27 states now with the reciprocation between Utah and some of the other states that I'm licensed in. Um, I do it because I think it's appropriate and it's a right that I have to carry. Um, I do support also campus carry in certain circumstances with the appropriate uh, training and, and restrictions that, that, that should go along with keeping campuses safe. Um, but I, I don't think that we should add any additional uh, requirements. I think we should in, enforce the laws that we have when it comes to background checks. I don't think we need any further gun registrations or other background checks to, to do that. Um, we have also have uh, different laws across different counties and, and cities. So if I drive from Henderson through North Las Vegas to my home, I've broken some laws if I haven't gotten out and taken my weapon and put it in the trunk and separated the ammunition and done all those things that allow me to, to possibly drive through North Las Vegas. Uh, I think that's difficult to abide by the law when they make it so cumbersome. Uh, so I think it would be good to have maybe some state level um, clarification on what those laws should be and some guidance on that. Great, thank you. Doctor, if you might ask the next question. Yeah, that is one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was here when we were uh, interviewing candidates for school board. They were all for Common Core. Mrs. Kramer, you are against it. I'd like to hear your opinion and also from Mr. Anderson. I've been on the record against Common Core since the 2012 Democratic Party Convention where I sought to keep its endorsement off of the party platform. As a mother of four children who had different disabilities, and particularly a son who has high-functioning autism, the Common Core math tells him that even though he has learned how to do the right answer, that he didn't draw the right graph, write the right story problem, is going to disenfranchise a generation of children who have ma a tremendous math talent, but they don't want to do that touchy-feely part. I'm concerned about the data collection. I'm concerned about corporations wanting to look at our children as profit centers. That what happened to that we take the limited tax dollars that we spend on education and actually putting it in the classroom instead of awarding contracts to major corporations such as Pearson and Microsoft to then again test. That we were able to learn how to read and write and have functional cognitive skills without having constant testing, testing to the test, and to look at the math homework that comes home, that children learn best through repetition and constant 
learning that I have a 16-year-old son and I have a 7-year-old son that the standards raised by nearly two and a half grade levels between my junior in high school and my first grader when they were in school, that's wrong. And that I believe that what we're doing is we're creating these common core tests and adopting this system so that we can turn around, say that schools are failing, then offer them a private corporate run solution. And when we do a corporate contract, the corporations are building in a level of profit for themselves. The standard is 15%. So why are we taking that 15% off the top and saying we want to give it to a corporation? We're taking money out of our classrooms because we always have money for when the corporation comes with their hand out than when students and teachers are coming with their hand out. Do I believe that we have always effectively spent? No. Thank you. So this is an area we don't differ too much from. I mean, we, we have concerns about what Common Core is bringing to the state. We've seen other states that are beginning to opt out, We've seen different reasons for their opting out. We've also seen the federal government come after certain states. Washington recently opted out and have now lost part of their federal funding for their education because they've opted out. So I think that there's uh, some serious concerns. You know, that some of the main concerns Christine already mentioned is that the data privacy part of it. We're collecting an enormous amount of data here in our school district. Some of that appropriate, some of it may not be. Uh, but the ability that the, that the school district and the state has to pass that up to a third party entity, which and then turns that over to the federal government, and what they can do with it, we lose that control. And uh, Senator Hammond and I are currently working on a bill draft request that would help kind of uh, keep that in the state and maybe even limit how much we can collect in the state. Uh, so it would be a state level decision rather than having each school district determine how much data can be collected and where it can be passed on. There's a lot, it goes in deep, and there's a lot of time that can be spent on, on this particular issue, but I think we have similar concerns uh, about its implementation, about how we adopted it, um, how it came about. The legislature didn't vote for Common Core. It came through uh, you know, some other, other means uh, and, and tied with strings attached to it. So I'm, in, I'm looking forward to further debate on the issue for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both, both for uh, being here. I appreciate it. Um, this question is for both parties. Uh, I truly believe that if you want something, you have to go get it. You have to work for it. Nothing is free in this world. What do you guys think about unemployment lasting two years? Sorry. Okay. Well, I, I think there's a combination of things that have added to that. And I think we could all look to um, certainly the, the more difficult you make it to get a job, which means support somebody longer on unemployment and the, the motivation to go out and get a job is, is a little bit different than if you know you have bills to pay next week you have a, a lot stronger motivation uh, during the recession we had people turn us down for jobs because it was only a few hundred dollars different or in the tech industry we paid pretty well it was only a few hundred dollars different than the unemployment they were getting and they had insurance and things like that that allowed them to stay home and not work gratefully they turned us down because those probably aren't the employees that we wanted in our team anyway but that said, I think there's some different motivators. One of my priorities this next cycle uh, will be to find ways, you know, what the school district does really well is we find smart kids and we get them going down a track that help them expand on their natural talents, right? We have AP courses, we have magnet programs. The one thing we don't do is find people that have the aptitude to be job creators, entrepreneurs, innovators. And it would be nice to be able to find a way to identify those. And there's studies out there that tell us some ways to do that and work that into our school district so that we can identify them earlier and give them a track to expand upon those natural aptitudes as well. Because job creators will be the ones that get us out of this. this Thank you. <coughs> it's a fact that the economy that not everyone is going to find a job no matter how willing they are. That I know that as a woman that often, and especially when I know as a woman who has four children, that if it's an opportunity and there's a single guy who's got no kids, it's probably not going to go to me, and that's what happens in a recession, that employers are able to be more selective. That I don't believe that anyone's family should starve because employers are being more selective. We can also look at that the economy is recovering, but the job sector isn't growing. That if you work a career 20, 30 years, even 10 years, and you find yourself unemployed, that as Americans, we used to stand together. I mean, we have to think about who benefits from keeping us divided and labeling some of us takers and some of us givers and some of us entrepreneurs. And 
Some of us are just too lazy to get off our butts. I don't believe that that's how America operates. I believe that we all need to work together to get everyone over the hump. And so I don't mind when I pay my unemployment insurance, I know that's keeping another mother and their family in their home. And if there's fraud involved with that, because you, I mean, as he's stating that there are people who are refusing jobs, that's fraud. Fraud needs to be convicted. But I don't believe that we need to punish our fellow Americans who work hard, if they're following the rules of unemployment, going out, applying for jobs every day, applying their skills, then why do we punish them? Thank you. Ms. Crater, if you would. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I guess mine is probably a little bit of a two-part question also. You guys talk about your family. And Could you please come. remind the panelists of the rules? <laughs> We're running out of time. Sorry, okay, okay. I'll, just keep, I'll just keep one, and I guess sure. I'll just have to address it to you, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson, last year you voted against um, Senate Bill 213 and SJR1. Can you tell me why? You want me to tell you what they were? Uh, yeah, remind me, were they AB 213 or SB? Old eyes. The uh, 213 was the trapping, and the SJR1 was the wild horses. So the resolution was, was simply that, just a statement in regards to the, the wild horses. I don't remember the details of that particular one. There was 1,100 bills that we went through this cycle. Yeah, these so. are the ones you voted to know why. I just want to know why. Yeah. So, again, there was 1,100 bills, so the specific, specifics of that, I'd be happy to get back to on those. On 213 on the trapping, was that the limitation of the distance, or do you remember the details of that particular bill? I didn't vote yes or no on it. I mean, I remember the bill. Okay. But I'm, I'm happy to get back to you on why I voted for those things or why I didn't vote for those things. Uh, but again, with 1,100 bills, there were specific bills that I carried and co-sponsored and went through, uh, and I don't remember ever seeing one at this point two years now. Great. Thank you. Mr. Broadway, if you might. <coughs> Hi guys, and thanks for coming. Uh, I know what the difficult times can be with you and your family, and I thank you. Uh, a lot of my questions were asked. I'm just going to run down a few items here. I just want to know yes or no. Okay, and go. Uh, campus carry, are you for or against? Uh, is this great? No. For. Gay marriage? Yes. Against. State lottery? Uh, children of illegals going to school. For or against? I think we're all for it. It is very school. expensive. I am for the education of any child who lives in my community. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We don't have any close. Is there any other question? We probably have time for one more. Could I would like do my two part? My second part? Sure. Is there specifics to it? I yes. don't want a general one. Yes, no. okay. I just want to know um, if you guys, there's going to be, um, if you get elected, there's going to be a bill coming for animal abuse registry. Would you be for or against that? For. I'm against it. Okay, is there one other, Mr. Baca? Oh, go right ahead. I have a question. Thank you both for coming today and allowing us to scrutinize you so publicly. Um, often I hear elected representatives refer to things like Common Core um, as basically, I hear you say you don't know about it until you see what other states do. Remember the rules. <laughs> I made them. You can be dismissed. Um, I would have a lot more faith in a representative who could look at a, 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 any situation and determine for themselves whether or not it's good for our state rather than using our students, or, or in any other case, uh, our citizens as guinea pigs to try something out, or a way to see how, my, how where it fails in other places before we subject our citizens to it. So with that in mind, I would like to know from each of you, are you aware of Agenda 21, Common Core, obviously you are, ICLEI, and how it's being implemented here, and what your thoughts are on it? Agenda 21 with the smart meters? They're, they're environmental. Agenda 21 has a lot of different aspects. Smart meters is one of them, yes. Yes, I am aware of it, and I'm aware that smart meters is the current implementation of it that has citizens upset. Are you asking if I would support it or? Yeah, your thoughts on it. Just I don't want to put words in your mouth. Just tell me your thoughts on it. Okay. I 
don't believe that from the outside we should tell people how to live their lives. That I would like the government out of my house, out of my bedroom. And that extends to I would like the government out of my smart meter. My family opted out of having a smart meter and I believe that that was an additional expense. I think that it should be a program that everyone opts into. Uh, that we use other technology in my house. My husband and I are both nerds. Uh, we monitor all of our own energy consumption because we don't want to spend any extra money than we have to. But I'd like to see those uh, opportunities uh, made available and more public and the ability to opt out made more public. Thank Great, you. Thank you. Uh, Agenda 21 certainly is something that if we don't like federal overreach, we certainly won't like the United Nations overreaching into, into our states and in our counties. I think it's something that we have to flat out reject. Um, the, they, they have that other consortium, the ICLEI, which is basically this world, um, um, what's the, the right word, uh, sustainability that basically would, you know, from cap and trade to a whole series of things that they would impose on our country, irregardless of whether our Congress agreed with it, whether our you know, future or current president agreed with it. Um, it's something that goes back to the 90s has been developed into just about every portion of our lives that they want to dictate at least some rules. And I would certainly do what I could on the state level to block those actions. Thank you. I want to thank both the candidates for coming today and thank the panelists for their questions and good luck on your race ahead. Thank you. With that, we'll close.